You all look like a friendly audience. That's good. I don't, I don't always go before friendly audiences. Sometimes they're kind of hostile. So, uh, in fact, uh, a few months ago, I got invited up to Olympia, Washington. Olympia, Washington is not a particularly, you know, uh, spiritual mecca. You know, it's kind of a dark place, not just because it's overcast most of the year. And so you go to a, there's a, there's a couple of college campuses in Olympia, Washington that are ve very dark. And I got invited to one of them to do a Christian message by a Christian club, which consisted of about, you know, three or four people, you know. So they bring me up to give a, a talk on their campus. And I prepared hard because I knew if anybody did show up, which I doubted, uh, that it would be a rather hostile place. So I was, I was ready for it. So they're walking me to the room where we're going to have this little presentation. I thought it was going to be a teeny room with, you know, 17 seats or something. It's actually a fairly big lecture hall, and there's a lot of people in there already. Well, on the way to this room, I noticed there was a poster on the wall, and it had my name on it. And uh, around my name were flames, you know. And, and the title of the event was, Come Barbecue the Christian, you know. Now, all right. Uh, now, it turns out there was a whole theme here. Uh, not only do you get to try to grill the Christian who's speaking, but they're actually going to give you barbecued chicken wings if you make it through to the end of the presentation. So, you know, feed the sinner, you know. So they were bringing in, I, I, you could smell it down the hall. They were bringing in gigantic tubs of barbecued chicken wings from the best barbecue place in town. Well, I guess everybody knew about this place because they were going to show up at this whatever event in order to get the free chicken wings. So the place was actually crowded. You could tell there were faculty members and grad students and undergrads and everything else sitting in there. And it was, but, but the theme was to grill the Christian. So I basically gave a quick five-minute opening and then just let the audience have at me, you know, asking hard questions. The whole atheist club was sitting in the front row with T-shirts on, you know, ready to go. Well, you know, I don't presume to be able to answer every question people can ask, but I got to tell you, this was not much of a challenge. And I try to encourage our, our apologetics students. You know, I run a graduate program in Christian apologetics, a master's program. In fact, some of you need to know about that. Because taking another master's degree right here at Biola is a way to defer your student loan payback just a little while longer. So you should consider the Master of Arts program in Christian apologetics. So I encourage students in my own program. I say, look, if, if you even listen to some CDs in... Uh, in the defense of the faith by some thoughtful Christians. You can rise to the top 5% of religiously literate people in the world. And they go, wow, those must be some lectures. I go, well, they're very fine lectures, but the comment is really not about the lectures. It's about the incredibly low level of understanding out there in the general public. Really. Uh, if you're coming out of Biola, if you get a chance to not only study scripture, but learn how to uh, present and defend the faith, uh, you really ought not to be very afraid because the low level of understanding the general public is, is a little bit disconcerting. So I'm standing there in front of this, this uh, group of, you know, this, in, uh, this group at this intellectual center, and they're getting ready to fire questions at me, and uh, they weren't very difficult at all. In fact, it, it felt like most of them had learned everything they know about Christianity from reading the Da Vinci Code. Really, it, it was that bad. Uh, only the atheist club could ask a really thoughtful question, and those weren't particularly challenging. So, uh, in fact, at one point, they, they kind of stopped. You know, maybe they were really hungry. I don't know, but they kind of stopped, but they knew they had to go the whole hour, so one guy decides to ask a question, you know. just You can tell they were just reaching for stuff at this point. Yes, sir. He goes, uh, do you believe in baptism? <laughs> I said, well, sir, uh, not only do I believe in it, I've seen it done. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny, because when they started laughing, things really became a lot more fun. People started to ask more fun questions, and we had a good time. Uh, so it ends, the, 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 the event ends, and people, I mean, literally, they just are climbing over each other to get to the chicken wings, you know. And they're loading up big plates. Now, this one lady, she didn't ask a question the whole time, but you could tell she was... She was a little bit agitated, so she, she got a plate of chicken wings and then ran up front to talk to me. So she's got the plate of chicken wings, and she's got one in her hand, and she's kind of waving it at me. And she already, she already has schmutz on her face, you know. <laughs> so, you know, my big problem with the Bible is the, the way it treats women. You know, there are enough women in the Bible. You know, 
I don't get it. You know, I, I've read Ruth and Esther and, you know, about the women in the New Testament. I mean, there's actually quite a few women. Uh, no, no, that's not what I mean. I go, but then I was just messing with her a little bit. I said, oh, I know what you mean. Instead of the three wise men, it should have been the three wise women, right? She's like, yeah, that's the thing I'm talking about, you know? <laughs> so, again, I was messing with her. You know, you know, actually, that makes a lot of sense because women ask for directions, and... and they would have arrived on time. They could have helped deliver the baby. They, they would have made a casserole, for goodness sake. They would have cleaned the stable, and they would have brought practical gifts. You know. And she was, she was satisfied with that. She walks away, you know, eating her chicken wing. Oh, that was, that was great fun. I'm actually going back there in a few weeks. They liked it so much. Maybe they liked the free chicken wings that this little club bought them. So I'm going back in a few weeks to do the same thing. Well, I, I had one other... Sp- slightly antagonistic encounter on a recent trip. I mean, just l- this last weekend, I was in Baltimore uh, teaching at a conference, and, and <laughs> honestly, watch out for the illustrations you use. I like to use jokes once in a while, and this one uh, was a little bit uh, hard on lawyers. You ever, you ever heard a, a lawyer joke before? <laughs> I'm sure you have. You know. So this was in Baltimore, which, you know, actually was a clo- little bit closer to Washington, D.C. than to Baltimore. So there's a lot of lawyers in that region, so I should not have used a lawyer joke. Right? So I made this joke that, uh, you know, compared uh, lawyers to jerks, you know. I didn't work very well. There was a guy two rows back. He was really agitated. Once the talk was finished, uh, he rushes up to me and he says, you know, I don't like these jokes that equate lawyers with jerks and so on. I go, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Are you a lawyer? He goes, no, I'm a jerk. That didn't really happen. <clears throat> I just learned that from Sean McDowell this weekend, though, in Baltimore, and I thought I'd try it out on you. He did it better. Well, welcome to Apologetics Week. This is a week where we actually talk a little bit about defending the Christian faith. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've caught on to this idea of being here at Biola, but uh, you know this Christian thing? It turns out to be true. Now, maybe most of you grew up in a Christian home. I did not. This is actually still a shock to me. I I literally wake up every morning going, I can't believe this turns out to be true. I was convinced, even as a a high school student, that if there is a God, which was pretty doubtful in my mind, there was simply no way to know that, that all religions were basically about what goes on inside an individual believer, and there's just no way to know these kinds of things. People are just desperately confused on these issues. I mean, to find out, that the evidence is dramatically in favor of the Christian faith. In other words, you Christians are in possession of the great story of all that ever was, is, or will be. You're you're in possession of it. My goodness, you know. What are we doing with that? And what are we afraid of? Because it turns out to be true. And what I mean by that is every fact in the known universe and the unknown universe really lines up with what is presented in Holy Scripture, this great story of all that ever was, is, or will be. Creation, fall, and redemption, and final culmination at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the true story. And all the evidence lines up. I don't know what we're afraid of. We do need to do a little homework because uh, the devil is very good at lining up people against us and giving them arguments that he thinks are pretty good. Uh, They're really not that hard to dismantle, and it's actually great spiritual activity to dismantle those arguments. Check this out. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, those of us who are in the apologetics biz, we're always looking for scriptures to help us because we go into a lot of churches that really don't think this is an important thing. I don't get that. We must travel in different circles because if I'm ever presenting the gospel to somebody, they are ready with about four or five quick objections to what I'm presenting. And those of you who share your faith know that's the case. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Paul writes this. This might, by the way, be one of the greatest spiritual warfare passages in Scripture. And Paul writes, For though we live in the world, and by world he simply means the physical world, as opposed to world of images or spirits or something. For though we live in the world, we do not fight, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. 
On the contrary, they, that is these weapons, have divine power to demolish strongholds. I want me some of those, you know? Oh my gosh, spiritual bazookas and stuff, you know? I want to know what these divine weapons are that can demolish strongholds. And the, I mean, in fact, what are these strongholds? This whole passage is actually interpreted in the next verse. Again, verse 4, the the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What are we demolishing? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. This is a great spiritual enterprise to go out and help people in a loving and kind and thoughtful way dismantle those barriers that block people from getting true knowledge of God. It's a great spiritual calling. Some people think that the whole apologetics enterprise is a little too philosophical, a little too factual, not enough uh, spirit. Uh, I don't read it that way. I think the Apostle Paul thought it was a great spiritual enterprise to do this. We've got to get people in front of of the cross, and we've got to dismantle those, those fortresses and those barriers that keep people from that. And that's what we're doing this week. One of these great fortresses, one of these great barriers to knowledge of God is one idea like this, that, that Christianity is just one religion among many, and they're all basically the same. I, I did my doctoral work in religious studies at UC Santa Barbara, and basically that, that was the ethos of the whole operation. There were There were many faculty and, you know, hundreds of grad students who basically bought that general idea that Christianity was was really no more interesting, uh, no more true, no more provocative, no more uh, salvific than Hinduism, Islam, Mormonism, Native American traditions, you name it. Is that the case? In my doctoral work, I discovered something by studying all of these great traditions, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, you name it. Christianity stands out in dramatic fashion. It stands out. Uh, I actually came out of a very secular program in religious studies at a University of California, a stronger Christian. By the way, not very many Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians darkened their door in the first place. So (laughs) it was funny when they discovered I was one, you know? It's like, whoa, you know, what are we going to do with this, you know? It turns out the, the Lord worked dramatically in their midst on my behalf. Which, by the way, ought to be encouraging to you because if you do something sort of provocative for God, he's there with you. In fact, I won so much scholarship money as a grad student, I felt terrible. I was actually a rich grad student. The other students were complaining about all the student loans they had. I actually had, like, a whole bunch of money. I applied for every scholarship under the sun, and the Lord uh, saw to it that I won every one of them. I'm not kidding. I would get a $10,000 check in the mail one week, The next week, I'd get another $10,000 check in the mail. I'd write the granting organization. Is it okay if I keep the second one too? Yeah, sure. You know, we think you're worthy. Oh, my goodness. And it turns out in the grad program, when they discovered I was some sort of conservative Bible-believing Christian, uh, that was troublesome at first, but soon I became their darling. You know, when we were at national conventions, one of my professors would see me in a hotel lobby, grab me, bring me over to other professors from around the country and introduce me. Here's Craig Hazen. He's a fundamentalist, you know? (laughs) I mean, you have to understand, this was the greatest badge of tolerance ever. We let one of these into our midst. Show me what you got, you know? (laughs) This craziness. But the Lord can work that way. He just turns things around without you expecting it. Let me give you a brief teaching, though, on how I saw Christianity standing apart from the other great religious traditions. Don't have much time to do this. Normally, I would give five reasons or five, five things to really focus on as to why Christianity stands apart. Maybe I'll give three or four this morning, depending on time. In fact, let me, let me, let me tell you about this uh, in the midst of telling a story because I first caught on to all these ideas really by the seat of my pants when I was giving a guest talk at a local community college. I get a call on the phone, right? It's actually a transfer call from the university operator. I guess somebody had called the university and asked for a fundamentalist to talk to. Now, we have hundreds of faculty members here. 
right? The, tra- the operator transfers it to me. I don't, I don't know what that says. So I pick up the phone, and it's a, it's a teaching assistant from a local community college. She's helping her professor set up a lecture series because they're at the end of a world religions survey course. And they want to bring in representatives of various religious traditions. And I was going to represent a fundamentalist Christianity. They must have heard that Biola was some sort of fundamentalist outfit, you know, and they call here, we're just overrun with fundamentalists, you know. So I thought, this is too good to pass up. So I didn't hesitate for a second. I said, you bet I'll be there. Then they told me it was like an 8.30 in the morning class. I go, oh, nobody's going to show up at an 8.30 class. So I get all prepped. I was going to give a talk on fundamentalism, and I get down there, and, uh, and uh, it was a fairly big lecture hall, bigger than I thought it would be for an early morning class, and students started to file in. They looked terrible at the moment, by the way. They bleary-eyed, and, you know, but fortunately they had gigantic cups of Starbucks. You know. So they were sitting down, and the professor gets up to introduce me, and his introduction wasn't particularly robust. You know. In fact, you could tell somebody had written it for him, and he was kind of trying to fill in the blanks. I don't remember what he said, but it, 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 it didn't endear me to him. You know? Plus, he looked terrible. It looked like he had the flu. And he, he, I mean, the way it sounded to me was, uh, you know, here's Craig Hazen. He, he memorized Bible verses at Bill's Bible College and Feedlot, you know? That's the kind of feel it had. So, uh, I go, oh, gee. When he went, he walked to the end of the row of first desk, and he sat at the end, and he just put his head down. When I saw him put his head down, I go, I have free reign, really. You know, I am now master of this classroom. So I just went in a whole different direction. I said, you don't really want to hear a lecture on fundamentalism, do you? No, not really. How about this? You're in a world religions class. A lot of people are in here. I know this. You're in here kicking the tires of, say, Buddhism or Hinduism, you know, maybe even Islam or Judaism. You're wondering which one you ought to sign up for because you're intrigued. You're intrigued by things of the spirit. You don't know much about them, and you want to learn about them. But I'll bet you nobody in the course of this uh, series has talked to you about how a thoughtful person would go about a religious quest. They're like, no. You can tell the Starbucks was starting to kick in. They were slithering up in their chairs a little bit. You know, a little more ready for action. Yeah, do that. All right, I'll do that. All right. So how would a thoughtful person go about a religious quest? And here you are in a college. You're studying accounting and art history and biology, organic chemistry, all kinds of important things, and you're engaging your mind on these subjects. How do you engage your mind on the topic of religion with regard to sorting them out to find just the right one for you? Well, it seems to me that... that it's, it's obvious that you would start that quest with Christianity. Actually, that's very, very similar to their reaction. Like. And th- there was this guy in the back. He had long blonde hair and a skateboard. He was, he was way smarter than he looked, you know? <laughs> um, and he was like my foil for the morning. Every time I'd say something a little bit provocative, he'd, he'd jump up and kind of counter it. He said, oh, dude, I thought you were not going to do fundamentalism. And the first thing you do is say Christianity is everything. I go, no, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, by the way, if you read my novel, Five Sacred Crossings, that's where I got the idea for the Darren character. So that guy's Darren. I don't know his actual name, but that's what I called him. So Darren's giving me a bad time about this. I go, oh, no, no. Well, look. Uh, let, me give you, let me give you five reasons why a thoughtful person would start their quest with Christianity. And that's what I ended up talking about the whole period. I'm not going to be able to go through all five with you, but let me give you a few of them. The first one, the first reason that a thoughtful person would start their quest with Christianity is that Christianity is testable. It's testable. You can offer evidence for it, you can offer evidence against it, and the evidence means something. And I even read to the class this this passage of Scripture. I called it the the strangest passage in all of religious literature. You're not going to find something like this in the Bhagavad Gita, the Buddhist Tripitaka, or the the Quran, or the Book of Mormon. This comes from 1 Corinthians 15, where the Apostle Paul says this. "If, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Later in the same passage, he says it again. Your faith is empty if Jesus did not come back from the dead. What does that mean? It means Christianity is testable. The Apostle Paul set it up that way. And by the way, Jesus and the prophets before him set it up that way as well. Christianity is a testable faith. You know, it's really true objectively. It's not just about what's going on inside of you. It ought to be true historically and objectively. And this is what the Apostle Paul is setting up here. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, Christianity is bunk. 
we really need to go do something else. According to Paul, according to Scripture that we hold so dear. Well, they, they caught on to that, the idea that Christianity is testable. I gave them some, some examples of some other religions that, that really aren't testable, like Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism is not objectively testable. You know, Zen Buddhism is all about the inner experience of the Zen Buddhist. It doesn't even matter, eventually, if the, if the Buddha existed, if he ever taught the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path, and so on. Everything is about what goes on inside the Buddhist. So it's not testable. So the first reason that a thoughtful person ought to start their quest with Christianity is that it's testable. Now, you can investigate it and discover whether it's true or false based on its own teachings. You, got, you with me there? So either Christ came back from the dead or he didn't. Or there's good reason to believe that he did, or really there's not good reason to believe that he did. Now it turns out that the evidence is startling, startlingly good with regard to the evidence that Jesus came back from the dead. He was, a, he was alive at point A, dead at point B, and alive again at point C. Thus says the historical record. I, I consider it the best known fact of the ancient world. Uh, God was very generous, leaving this tremendous path of evidence back to that time so that we could know it to be true today. Wish I could give you a whole presentation on evidence for the resurrection because it's very powerful. We've got the goods on this, and we ought not to be ashamed to use it. Christianity is testable. The second reason that a thoughtful person would start their quest, quest with Christianity is that in Christianity, salvation is free. Salvation is free, right? We don't make enough of this, by the way. This is big. Students immediately understood what free is. They're students, you know? They're always looking for a free music download, free haircut, free sandwich. You know, they understood the concept of free. So when I mentioned free salvation, they go, oh, tell me more, you know? I said, there's no, in Christianity, there's no crawling over jagged rocks for miles to lay some offering in some temple. There's no, there's no sitting in arthritic lotus positions for hours on end, you know, uh, attempting to move towards enlightenment. It's free. It's a free gift from God. And I read to them, I read to them Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not the result of works that no one should boast. That is a dramatically unique teaching to Christianity. There's some concept of grace here and there sprinkled throughout the history of religions. Nothing like this. This is an amazing trump card. It also, it also makes Christianity uh, utterly egalitarian in that salvation is open to everyone. You don't have to be a spiritual superstar in order to access salvation in Christ. It's funny to see the superstar roster you have in, say, Hinduism when you hear a guy about a guy in a town who can levitate or something, you know, everybody flocks to see him, you know, and there's this whole spiritual hierarchy. Not in Christianity, you are all saved by the same thing. It's the gift of God to you so that no one should boast. That's dramatic. Uh, reminds me of a time in, uh, I was in Paris, I was teaching in Strasbourg, and I went to Paris for the weekend, and I picked up this book these wonderful booksellers along the Seine River there. And it was, the, it was the wisdom of the Ayatollah, you know, a great teacher in Islam. And I'm reading it, and he's trying to help people make their fast count during Ramadan, right? Faithful Muslims fast during daylight hours during the month of Ramadan. And he's trying to help people, and, and he's, he's getting involved very deeply in the act of fasting. And he's, he's, he says, consider this. We have, to, we have to really take this seriously. You're sitting in a comfortable chair in a warm room, and there's a window open, and the faithful Muslim falls asleep in the chair, and his head cocks back thusly. Mouth open, notice. And a fly comes in the window, and the fly goes into and out of the Muslim's mouth. Has the fast been nullified? See. And then he goes on for pages analyzing this situation. And then he, he analyzes other situations like, what if dust gets into your mouth? Would that nullify the fast? Well, it depends. What kind of dust was it? Could you anticipate that there would be dust in the air? Was it dust from a road while you're driving a car? Was it dust from a flour mill? And by the time you're finished reading just a few pages of this section on fasting, you're just exhausted. <sighs> you know, oh my goodness. It makes you want to cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, just save me. There's no way I can live up under this burden. 
so that second reason that a thoughtful person would start their quest with Christianity is that salvation in the system is free. I'll jump to the fifth reason. The fifth reason, which was a bit provocative to them, the fifth reason that a thoughtful person would start their quest with Christianity is that Christianity has Jesus at the center. Well, you can imagine that caused old Darren to stand up again, the surfboard guy. He stands up, and he's like, oh, man, you really did it, didn't you? You kept us going. We thought this was pretty good, a little bit, uh, you know, not fundamentalist. But then you threw in the the F-bomb, the fundamentalist bomb, like right at the end, saying, uh, we ought to start with the religion that has Jesus at the center. Now, isn't that stacking the deck? I said, oh. You know, I looked over to make sure the professor still had his head down. He did. By the way, he didn't have the flu. He had a terrible hangover. Uh, that's what I learned later. It turns out he has a hangover during most of this time uh, during the term because he brings in guest speakers and he can go on drinking binges all night and, and chase girls. So I don't feel bad that I uh, dissed him a little bit. Uh, so I looked over. He was still, uh, he was still had his head down. I said, uh, what in the world have you been learning in this class, you know? Uh, that, that shouldn't shock you at all because every great world religious tradition around today wants a piece of Jesus. Really, they want to own him. They want to co-opt him. They want to make him their own. I mean, if you look at uh, Buddhism, for instance, many great Buddhist teachers think that Jesus is an incarnation of the Buddha himself. If he's not that, he's a great bodhisattva who helps to bring people along to the point of enlightenment. Many Hindus believe that Jesus is certainly a great teacher, but he might very well be an incarnation of Vishnu, the great Hindu god. Uh, Islam. In the Quran, Jesus emerges as a figure greater than Muhammad himself. I don't know the exact score. It might be like Jesus 4, Muhammad 2. I'm not sure. But Muhammad is thought to be a prophet in the Quran. Well, so is Jesus. But Jesus is also born of a virgin, and he's considered a miracle worker. And he's going to be standing with Allah at the judgment scales at the end of time. I mean, this is, this is pretty substantial stuff. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. So it makes sense that a thoughtful person on a religious quest would start that quest with the religion that has Jesus firmly planted at the center. So I gave them, I had to skip over a couple for you, but I gave them five reasons that a thoughtful person would start their quest with Christianity. And they were, they were dumbfounded by most of this. They had never heard anything like this. Nobody had actually evaluated the various religious traditions. But I think you can see that I was sneaking in interesting ideas through the side doors. And they appreciated that a lot. In other words, if I'd gotten up there and said, Christianity is true, and let me show you five reasons why it's true, they really wouldn't have listened to me. But they they were very intrigued about this way to take a religious journey and a religious quest. But God has been faithful. He has laid out a tremendous trail of evidence so that we can make our case effectively. Our Heavenly Father, our great King, what a joy it is to serve you. What a joy it is to know that you have not left us stranded in our own time, but you have given us the evidence so that we can be sure that you are the only way to the Father, Lord Jesus Christ. We need you desperately. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Help us, Lord. Help us to be great witnesses. We are in possession of the great story of all that ever was, is, or will be. And by your Spirit, we can make a We can turn the world upside down in our generation. May it be so, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.